with the entire population. All right. Um, I was given um, a topic in terms of uh, sharing with you about, um, uh, let me just present this. Um, uh, what investors look for in your business. And um, uh, it would be prudent for me to give you an idea a bit of, uh, about um, my background and the book access so that when I'm able to, when I go through the topic, you are able to appreciate um, a few things in line with the same topic. So I'll just uh, start at this juncture. Um, I work with Imuka Access, and uh, Imuka Access is a technology-driven social enterprise um, that is keen to facilitate access to financing and business support services to entrepreneurs in Uganda uh, and beyond. Our mission is really to provide financial financing and um, business support services, and we envision um, enterprises that we achieve the potential. Uh, it pains us as we look at a lot when we see a business which is very novice, which is very innovative, but it rarely moves beyond the borders of uh, whether a region or a country. When we see a lot of innovations moving continents from Europe and from Asia, and that is why we do what we do. So we support entrepreneurs in two models. One is a group kind of support, where we support entrepreneurs in a group and present them to investors uh, in a model called Pitch Fest, where we, we, you'll always see around um, advertorials of Pitch Fest where entrepreneurs want to be connected to investors and usually we support them as a group. It's uh, a subsidized model that helps us to still support entrepreneurs and give them the necessary guidance uh, prior to presenting to investors. And then we also have a personalized support. So usually these people are looking for more than 500,000, a million, five million, but usually they can far being posted on a personalized level, but also you'll understand that some of these organizations are quite big and they need um, personalized support tailored to their uh, model. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. And uh, typically the kind of support aims as aimed at helping the entrepreneurs have a demonstrated strategy, a justified capital needs, uh, to make it easy for due diligence uh, with investors and to ensure that the priorities are, risk, are less risky or are not risky, uh, or they are de-risked from the perspective of the investors. And probably you under, will understand me when I proceed to share with you some of the things that investors look at. Um, yeah, this is basically how we go through the process in terms of screening, um, needs assessment, and then supporting the entrepreneurs before connecting them. Uh, on my side, uh, as a person, I have over 10 years in business incubation, acceleration, investment readiness, and access to financing. Uh, we support both individuals and organizations in this journey. Uh, I have a thought, or I love the aspect of supporting businesses, especially in strategic business planning, financial modeling, uh, business valuation analysis, so that um, that usually helps them understand what value they're presenting before investing. And um, it's an area that I'm very passionate about. We've worked with uh, entrepreneurs directly and indirectly in some organizations which work with us, and also directly in our programs to support entrepreneurs raise uh, a total of over 5 million currently. I also work in Climate Launchpad. It's an international climate-focused uh, program, so I'm one of the certified uh, coaches. I'm also an adult trainer um, um, uh, with the UK-based uh, institution. Okay, so I'll go direct into this topic, what investors look for in your business. And... Um, uh, when we look, when we talk about investors, we have to understand that um, investors come with two financial, two forms of financial instruments, and, um, and uh, most of them will still take this format of debt and equity as much as they take different names uh, in terms of hybrid patterns. But most of them fall under either a debt kind of structure, uh, which most of you look at it as loan or equity, where they take 
at stake in your business. So in debt, usually you're borrowing uh, to be paid back uh, with some interest, usually. Um, when in equity, you're actually selling a piece of the pie or a piece of your business, or you're giving a piece of your business um, in exchange of uh, in exchange for the, the resources of money. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just uh, resources come in different ways, uh, but generally that can be uh, quantified in terms of money. And uh, for you to consider whether you are going for debt, equity, or sometimes both, um, many times it's dependent on your business model, how, how your business works, um, the industry, your financial need, what do you need the money for? What stage of the business are you at? Usually those factors help you determine which instrument would be best for you at any particular time. Um, and yeah, based on those considerations, um, we're going to now look at from the investor perspective. Now, um, we have quite a number of investors. Um, uh, before, um, when we were in the journey of uh, pursuing Inuka Access, um, initially we thought there were no funds and, um, and we were actually on the journey of trying to create a fund. And then when that journey started, we really met a lot of different investors. And uh, every, every day, every year, we discuss with quite a number. What we realized is there are a lot of different funds, but uh, their targets, their focus, their interests are very different, or they vary one to another. And um, I'll just give you an insight from what they mainly uh, focus on. So majority of the funds usually set a criteria, and the common criteria they look at is one, uh, most of these funds have a geographical focus. So you will not find a fund that is keen to invest everywhere. There are those which are focused maybe in East Africa, some in Uganda, some in South Africa. Yeah. So one, you may be engaging investors, but you are not within their geographical focus. So sometimes you have an investor who could probably support you, but you are not within his geographical focus. Usually that is a deterrent. Then uh, the other bit is um, the investors also have a focus on the stage of the business. Many times we're just looking for investors, but we don't know that um, most of them have different focus uh, stages. Okay, so some are in the pre-seed or pre-seed means you are, you are fairly in early stage, but there's a huge potential seed stage. You've probably tested your model and you're ready to get over. And then uh, there's the growth stage where you've tested, uh, there's ready traction, you are just basically telling that. So depending on the stage, um, each stage attracts a different kind uh, of investor. And most of them have already categorized where they fall. Then some, um, um, all of them have that sector, se sector agonistic focus. They focus on certain sectors. But um, you notice that you may have the right business, but the wrong sector. Even if you're making money and it's not their focus of sector, their, their, their sector focus, then do not uh, waste a lot of your time in that. You need to understand that they have a sector focus. And when you pay attention or when you Google, because some of you actually take some time to actually see which investors, you need to look at what sectors they focus on. And then financial instruments, as I mentioned earlier, some give debt, some give equity, some give both debt and equity. It's usually uh, um, uh, uh, many would prefer to give one instrument at a time and not combine both in the same time. But as I said, uh, some focus on giving debt or loan, some focus on giving equity, some can give a combination of debt and equity, depending on. Uh, uh, Roy, um, there is a bit of an echo in your, in your presentation. There's an echo. Uh, that's better. I don't know whether having a bit of earphones may help. 
Um, okay, let me try and use the earphones. The only challenge is sometimes uh, people complain that the voice does not come out clearly, but let me let me oh, put you a bit closer to the device eh, so that we can All hear right. you. Am I loud enough now? Yeah, that's better. Okay, maybe I just need to be closer to the speaker. All right, uh, maybe let me just uh, repeat a bit. Um, I mentioned earlier, majority of the funds set criteria uh, prior to even starting to invest. They determine which geographical focus they are going to focus on in investing. So some focus maybe regionally, for example, it could be in Uganda and they say, okay, we shall only do Western, Central. Some is country focus, maybe they'll say in Uganda. Okay, uh, some look at the stage, the stage of the business. Are you in pre-seed, are you in seed, are you in growth? Uh, depending on where you are, they focus in that. Then there are those who are looking at sector, uh, the particular sectors. So they define the sectors that they focus on. So you may have the right concept, the right idea you're making, where you've probably met the other criteria, but you're in the wrong sector, the sector that they need within their focus, then obviously they will not uh, look at you. Then financial instruments, depending on the kind of instrument, are you looking for debt? Uh, are you looking for equity or a combination of both? Uh, depending on the financial instrument that you are looking for, then that usually determines because some of them only give debt, some give equity, some give a combination. So if it falls within that um, uh, criteria that they then they will certainly um, engage uh, potentially look at engagement. Then some look at the investment round, okay? The investment size and the investment round. Some prefer when you've already received some money before from another. Some prefer probably being the pay setters or the initiators. Some, uh, so they come at different levels. The way you go to nursery, primary, secondary. So some investors know that they're in primary level. Some know they're in nursery level, some know they're in secondary level. So depending on where you are, uh, the, the size. So some will not find even them interacting with you. Uh, initially, you creating an engagement. It may be another investment which has come, which has invested in you that now initiates a connection with them. So depending on the investment round uh, you're looking at. And then some look at um, impact definition. So you'll notice generally, uh, based on this criteria, uh, quite a number of uh, investment firms or funds tend to have some of these um, areas, or these are the commonest criterion areas or criteria areas where the, it can be a combination of geography, stage, sector, instruments. So the first thing, even before engagement, uh, your business is to fit within this criteria that they have before any engagement starts. Because sometimes that is the first point where most entrepreneurs don't understand. They just assume this is a fund and uh, yeah, let me submit because uh, they give money. But you've not paid attention. Are you within the geographical focus? Um, have you paid attention to the state? Have you the focus, the sectors? Are you within the sector that they focus? The investment, uh, the financial instrument that you ask, whether it's state or equity, is it what they give? Uh, the investment side, you may be needing 100,000 when they start from 500,000. You may be needing 500,000 when they give only between 100 and 500,000. Okay, then impact. Some are looking at maybe supporting farmers' empowerment, some look at empowering women, some look at climate. So, depending on all within their criteria. So before the conversation, sometimes it's good to just get a fair understanding in terms of this investor or these investors or this fund that I'm engaging, am I within their common criteria? Many entrepreneurs do not pay attention. So you may have the right business, but the, you're speaking the right business to the wrong person. Okay, so usually that is one of the starting points where entrepreneurs you will find oh I've talked to ten investors and then that have you paid attention on where they where they sit or where their focus areas the way you focus 
and say this will be my territory. So they have already created their territories or their focus uh, niches that if you don't fall within their niches, then um, it becomes difficult to even have a conversation because to them it's a waste of time. You may think it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense to them. It may be a sweet business, a super business to praise you, but they have focus sectors that they cannot deviate from. All right. The other thing that uh, I probably wanted also to mention is um, especially for equity. Equity for equity financial instrument is almost like a marriage uh, where you give a stake of your business. Many entrepreneurs do not know that whenever an investor comes in to give equity or invests equity or takes a slice of your business, they come in with an exit strategy. They usually have the exit strategy plan. And usually this is something you can actually discuss with them prior to even the investment. Okay, so uh, the exit strategy means they they want to dilute, like they yes, they will come, maybe they'll take 10%, 20%, whatever percentage of the business, but at some point they want to recoup their money. Okay, and that means they want to, at that point they either want to exit or so they usually have an exit strategy in mind. And what are some of the exit strategies that they usually consider. So sometimes they you agree or negotiate that after five years, you will buy back your stake. Eh? I hope some of you are now excited because sometimes entrepreneurs fear giving stake because they wonder, oh, is this person going to be here the entire time? So you actually have an opportunity to negotiate that you can buy back. Obviously the value of your company will have increased, so you will obviously pay handsomely back for your stake. But you can actually, um, get back uh, a stake. So you can buy back. That could be an exit strategy that you negotiate. Then there is uh, management uh, buy in, buy out. I'm going to pay attention on buy out. Um, so there is an instance where um, where the investor likes your business or the entrepreneur really created a business that Looks, but it's not something they are so passionate. But it's a business that really makes sense, and it's so sometimes they can buy you out and say, "Okay, you sell for us the business, we can pay you." So uh, it's something that you not uh, well. I've noticed it's quite common uh, when you look at the European ecosystem. Yes, you'll find there's something called mergers and acquisitions, acquisitions, eh? especially acquisitions where investors acquire businesses. Entrepreneurs start to start a business to sell. It's actually a business to start a business to sell. So you'll find uh, very innovative entrepreneurs starting a business which could be very innovative and they invest a lot of energy, time, and strength. Within three years, they've created value where they allow or they put that business to be acquired. So uh, an investor basically buys a huge chunk of the stake of the business. Okay, so that is, um, you can be bought off. It's something common that I've noticed here when we have a culture of ownership. We want to maintain ownership of the business, which um, may be different, but yes, uh, some entrepreneurs, I've seen a few in Uganda who start a business to actually sell. And if you, it's a very lucrative, especially if you understand the dynamics. When in some cases, um, your business can be bought in. So for example, you see WhatsApp, Facebook bought WhatsApp in, Facebook and uh, I think they bought it at about 19 billion. Okay, so where Facebook gave uh, WhatsApp some stack and some money. So they bought them in because they needed their technical competence still in maintaining WhatsApp, but they wanted to own WhatsApp. So that can happen. And then um, there are those who, um, their exit strategy will, when you reach, okay, you, maybe they give you $100,000 and now. Uh, you've grown now your appetite. Usually the business appetite grows as you expand. So initially you attracted $100,000 and now you've reached your appetite has now gone to maybe $500,000 or a million or a million. That means you need more money. So usually sometimes uh, the value of um, uh, 100000 now may not be the same value maybe in 10 years, it may be more. So usually they sell um, they sell the stake to another investor in a second uh, round or a third round, depending on 
the race uh, are you in the second race third race i think you've seen um uh, in the papers uh, there's this company called Tugende. Tugende has recently raised another was it 30 million either 12 million or 30 million then there's also a sack which raised about 12 million uh dollars so actually this year you got um hello uh, roy um there's yeah. some your volume is a bit low and a bit unclear according to the comments in chat okay let me just um let me just see if i i can i don't know okay seems to be okay. and also your audio seems to be a bit unclear just from comments in chat all right um that is noted let me try and um, still uh, increase the voice as far as i can so um i was on um, some investors, their exit strategy is to sell to other investors so they can trade to other funds or other investors. Uh, remember, the, the people you become, uh, the more opportunities. Just picture, for example, an athlete. If I want to be the national champion, I will probably work with a coach within the country. Then if I want to be maybe an international champion, I may need another coach or another expert to take me to that level. The same happens to business. You'll be with this investor at this round. Then when you grow to another round or another stage, then another investor basically comes in uh, to invest or work with you at that level. So that usually happens. Then uh, some investors look at selling you to, or, or you uh, exiting with industry partners. So you may find you have an innovation that MTN can acquire, NSSF, so they, they would be willing to sell to an industry partner the stake that they acquired in your business. So all this happens. And then there's also a limited strategy of having an initial public offering where you sell your shares to the public. I think you saw last year, was it last year or last year, but one MTN uh, put their shares in um, an initial public offering. I think Airtel should be doing that soon. Yeah. Uh, based on the regulations. So these are some of the exit strategies. So I just wanted to emphasize that, especially when it comes to equity, equity investors come with an exit strategy in mind because they have to ensure that they are getting their return. So they always have to have an exit strategy. And most of them invest for a period between um, three to five years. So within uh, at around the fifth year or seventh year, they usually um, actualize their exit where you can buy back, you can buy you out, depending on uh, uh, the, the circumstances or priorities at that particular time or what you negotiated in the beginning. Uh, let's go to um, now for, for investors to now come in. Uh, right, your, your audio has become muffled again. Roy, possibly let us try the, the, the earphones and we see how that goes. Okay, let me try the ear. Am I loud? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Is it much better? Yes, it is. All right, let me proceed with this, if this is much better. Okay, so before investors come in now, assuming you meet the criteria geographically, uh, you fit within their financial, um, investment size, sector, uh, impact, whatever. So they will need to do what we call due diligence where they come and assess, okay? They want to deeply assess who you are, to authenticate, to validate that you are who you say you are and you are actually exactly what they, or you fit within their criteria. So in due diligence, um, Investors evaluate your business model, they evaluate your organization in terms of compliance, your governance, your policies, uh, 
um, the strategy, they will also evaluate based on the amount of money you want or what you need the money for. Does it fit within or they can structure? Then they look at your documents. Then they also evaluate. They evaluate um, your business in terms of growth and what are the risk factors. Usually the due diligence process defines or helps them determine um, how they can structure the funds and how much they can give you um, in terms of the funds. So um, the due diligence process is a process that uh, always happens prior to investment. And it's usually uh, a point where by the time you move to due diligence, it means one in fitting within the criteria that um, the funds have set. Now they want to check you out to validate that, okay, the picture that they got initially, top overview is actually what it is and they can actually invest. Okay, now, um, now on due diligence, there are what we call common pitfalls or uh, the turnoffs or what now um, makes investors really go off or simply makes them uh, move out from investing you or change their mind, if I'm to put it that way. These are the commonest pitfalls um, well, from the investor's perspective. Uh, one is financial systems and management. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is the more money you want, the more scrutiny you attract as a business. The more money you want, the more scrutiny because um, imagine you want a million dollars uh, for your company to whatever set up and whatever. They have to evaluate how are your financial systems um, and how is the management, is it competent? Okay, so they will look at, okay, I want $1 million. What are they, where do you want to invest? So what are your financial priorities? Does it make sense to invest say in land, um, in machinery, or there are other alternatives that you can pursue. I'll probably talk about this in the next slide in terms of priorities. Some of the common priorities, which may be a uh, turn off, uh, depending on how or where you are. Then the use of funds. Some of you, yes, you want a million, but where you want, where you want to put in the funds or where you want to invest or the things you want to invest in, do not... Um, are not uh, areas that would logically uh, attract an investor to invest in, if I'm to put it that way. So um, a good example is, say, uh, I like giving this example, um, you need 500 million, for example, you want to set up a machinery to start producing, say, yogurt. You've always had a lot of milk in your, um, in your production, you have people in fresh milk and you want to start producing. You want to set up a big plant, maybe a very big plant. Uh, yeah, and that is a cost of 300 million. Now, since you've not started producing yogurt, uh, a typical investor would come and evaluate Is there an alternative way of producing yogurt without having this machinery fast? Before we buy this machinery and probably the product and um, and its absorption in the market or some things, uh, or it doesn't work. So probably if they are saying, I know we have uh, Uganda Industrial Research Institute, we have Food Technology Business Incubation Center, and a number of different incubators that have these processing plants, they would probably prioritize you to initiate and produce from such hubs so that you develop the product and justify and get some traction, keep them securing um, the machinery, because it's quite risky setting up a whole plant when you've not tested. So your priorities, the use of funds. Now, sometimes they come in and actually in the process of assessing, they actually realize that there's a lot of fraud. You've been misusing your resources. Uh, remember, there's, there, there's assumption that the business is the business and you are the independent for, of the business. So sometimes um, there's fraud or misappropriation uh, or previously you benefited from another fund and you messed up. Um, this always happens because in, if, if, you, if previously you benefited from another fund, investors talk to each other. 
and they usually ask, okay, for example, if you're investing in ROI, uh, they, they will ask the previous investor, how was ROI uh, as a client? Did he, did he behave? Um, was he um, cooperative in the engagement or there was a problem? So uh, your history can determine your engagement with future investors. And that's why we usually encourage entrepreneurs. Whenever you go into engaging investors, try and build a good reputation and good character. Do not borrow money, disappear, and whatever, because it closes doors for you for other investment rounds, okay? Especially if you intend to grow your business and scale it to a very big level, ensure that you have and build a good reputation and um, yeah there are circumstances where your business may not work or the environment say covid there's a lockdown things change communication you can structure the funds you can negotiate but you need to ensure that you're managing the resources well because you want to them for resources for a particular place now you need not to divert without agreeing with them actually want to change either the strategy or whatever that will also be perceived as misappropriation or fraud okay so on financial systems and management that is very critical beyond that obviously um your, your documents your financial documents uh history all that will be evaluated Basically, uh, i think uh, we are we were we are running quite well there but something okay. happened uh, and we and went back a bit, so possibly you can ju just adjust the mic a bit closer. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, then there is um, leadership and talent. Now, um, sorry, you, and, um, you normally start a business in terms of your friend, you hire your friend to support you, you hire your relative. It may be okay in the beginning, but competence becomes key as you start scaling and as you start attracting funds. So sometimes uh, an investor may want to come in your business to invest, but they may say we want you to fire your finance, we want you to fire this HR or operation. Simply because they feel they are not competent or they do not qualify. Okay? So sometimes that happens. Uh, if they are good, if they are bad, they may just decide, okay, you know we cannot invest because you don't have the right team or the team is not competent enough to manage the funds that we want to give you. Okay. So leadership is key uh, action. That one I was looking at to ensure that your you team is competent but you keep on skilling or you keep on training or at least there is an aspect of talent development. Where as you grow the talent of the team also is a competent. And then leadership. Are you visionary? Are you looking at going fast? I know it's all person. You cannot be corrected. Maybe if there's a problem, you feel like you, you shouldn't be told. So the, the, your character is critical. They, especially when it comes to equity, remember, it's almost like a marriage. So somebody has to look at who am I trying to work with? Who am I going to work with? Is he a person? Right. ideas on or not okay so that usually is very critical yes ronald yeah i think uh, i think we keep jumping in and out of an echo uh, but uh, let, let's keep going i will we'll keep monitoring it okay thank you so that's, on leadership very, that's a very good spot where you are i think it's just the network on and off i guess but it yeah, is let me like let, let me just try and villages. yeah, let me just try and um, okay. so leadership and talent is where um you need to pay attention. Remember, beyond investing in the business or whatever, they invest in the people behind the business. So the leadership and the competence of the team becomes very critical when investors are making an investment decision. That is why sometimes they ask, uh, they will ask, obviously, depending on the amount of money, can we see the CVs or the, the, the profiles of the team and their roles? So sometimes they may actually ask you to hire 
uh, an additional person or another competent person, depending on the funds and depending on what the project is all about. So that is usually a critical area. Remember, they are trying to ensure that their money is utilized right with the right people so that they do not lose. So leadership and talent becomes an area of interest. Then the third area that they usually look at, which can be also a turn off, is your scaling strategy and your projections. So um, a good example of strategy is, for example, Safe Border. Safe Border is a business that uses the share economy, share the economy model. Where they basically recruit border border. Imagine if you are doing what Safe Border does and instead of Recruiting borders, you actually decide that your business will be doing the border and offering the service of border border. Okay, so it may make business sense, but how scalable is that? You notice that if you go on this other alternative model, to require a huge amount of resources. Um, the last time I checked, Safe Border in Nigeria has over a million border borders subscribed. So imagine if you have. If you are to procure a million border borders, just buying before actualizing the business model in that particular country, how fast can you go? So um, your scaling strategy determines your scalability or otherwise. So your scaling strategy usually is very critical. So sometimes you go, you are, you are, you are trying to raise funds, but based on your scaling strategy, if you are if you, you um, uh, the, the best way to, to, to explain is, if your scaling strategy has more fixed costs than variable costs, then it means you, are, you will take longer to scale because fixed cost means you are actually implementing literally, you are actually implementing literally where you have to buy, you have to, you have to do this stuff, while variable is where you actually, um, outsource, but you actually still deliver on the task, the way Airbnb. Imagine if Airbnb decided to, instead of um, recruiting people who have homes, hotels, they decide to build homes and hotels across the world. Would they reach uh, the current over five or 10 million households and uh, locations where somebody can sleep across the world if they decided to go the latter? So your scaling strategy, um, can be an attraction or a distraction uh, to an investor. And that is an area that um, uh, usually is very critical. Um, and uh, just for purposes of uh, priorities, one thing I wanted to share is entrepreneurs need to look at um, some of these priority areas. The instances where you can you, you need to hire, there are some instances where you can outsource some of those activities. So at that particular point, is it better to insource or outsource? Okay, uh, you need resources maybe to buy machinery. Do you need the machinery at that particular time or you can outsource the production uh, process until a certain stage? So this decision usually becomes critical. Um, is it better to buy land or to lease land. Imagine if buying land was 500 million and leasing is actually 50 million for five years. Would you uh, probably invest in leasing the 5 million and having more working capital than buying land which sinks the money and then you find that you're actually um, off, off, um, off the radar where you need more money to achieve the same goal. And usually this buying and leasing decision is where you find uh, many entrepreneurs here locally will say, oh, now this Chinese has come, his business has grown very fast. This Indian has come, his business has grown in very fast. But you'll find our priorities. Sometimes you feel you need to buy a car or a, a distribution truck when you could actually lease or maybe you could actually lease space for a period of time. So that reduces the risk on money or sinking of the money and allows you to have enough money to do the core objective. So usually some decisions or some priorities um, via of the core objective of the business. And that is something that investors 
do not like. They prefer maintaining the core objective of what they want um, the business to be able to do. Then uh, in some cases, uh, the decision of investment versus acquisition. You will find the instances where um, most of us like starting something afresh. I want to start producing maize. We want to start producing yogurt. But have you ever thought that there are actually some small businesses that you could acquire? They already have a product, a brand. They're small. They have potential, but they're obviously stuck. Instead of starting afresh, hiring new staff, buying equipment, why not at half of that price acquire an existing company and take it to another level? This is an area, and that's why you'll find there are few local investors, okay, uh, who are keen because most of us by mindset or by culture, we have what we call an, an ownership syndrome where we prefer, uh, we prefer, eh? I need to own, I need to buy, I need, when you can actually acquire an existing business and actually take it to another level. So some of these priorities, priority areas, you will find they are simple decisions, but they actually incur a lot of resources, but they're actually for the wrong objectives, which via the business of the main objective of what it's supposed to do. So these are usually very critical areas. Now to go back on these common pitfalls um, and maybe just for the interest of um, uh, the people who are here, um, on aspect of financial systems and management, uh, this area, I just wanted to interest you that um, we, currently, um, uh, we currently have partnered uh, to support entrepreneurs uh, to improve their financial systems and, uh, and management. And this is a partnership program where we want to deploy advanced accountants or CFOs, if you prefer calling them, or professional uh, advanced financial accountants in companies. Uh, we, this program is in partnership with Chicago Booth University. And uh, the program um, is targeting companies that have already created employment of 10. Well, that can include the director uh, because he's running the company, but where you've created at least 10 jobs. So the program wants to plug in an advanced CFO. So if you have an accountant, um, a bookkeeper in your company, that is fine. We are not, the program is not to replace, it's to improve the financial processes and systems in these companies. So we are encouraging um, entrepreneurs who have created over 10 jobs uh, to apply for this program. Uh, where we plug in a CFO or an advanced accountant. And this program, uh, these CFOs or accountants will visit your company for a period of three months. They will deploy a software or a system, an accounting package, and they will train your team. Uh, well, whether you have five, 10, one person, they will support your team to improve your systems and processes. They will help you in financial planning, budgeting, costing, helping you understand if there have been errors, if there have been misappropriation internally that you may not know, maybe internal staff have been stealing from you, maybe your priorities are just wrong. Um, maybe you don't understand that you're actually investing or your business is performing wrong in, in, um, wrongly and you are, you are actually eating your capital and you don't know based on the activities. Uh, the team is, in, the program help, wants to help these companies achieve um, the best financial uh, processes and practices. And this allows them to be more investment ready. So uh, if you at whatever particular time you need to access financing, most of these investors will find that your financial uh, systems and management are standard uh, and are in place to attract the kind of money. But it also helps you. Sometimes as entrepreneurs, we go for loans that our businesses cannot accommodate. And sometimes we just don't know because we see we are making a lot of money. But in the process of making money, we're actually making losses. So we want to help these companies. As I, as I said, the, unfortunately, the target is looking at companies which have more than 10 employees. Um, but if you fall in that category or you know a company that falls in that category, this is a great opportunity uh, for such businesses to benefit. Imagine 
getting a CFO in your company, uh, even just for one day, how much would you pay that person? And this program uh, subsidized because 95% of that cost, the entire cost, them supporting you for three months um, is, is totally paid for. Uh, but because the program wants to ensure that the entrepreneur is committed and midway, uh, the entrepreneur does not change the mind when you are being supported and uh, suddenly move out of the program. So it requires that the entrepreneur who is who will be selected. So applying is free, but if you will be selected to be supported, you will make a, your, your contribution of 380000 or an equivalent of $100 simply to ensure that you, you also have goodwill in the program, but these CFOs will support the businesses for three months. I think that is exactly what I've been explaining. And um, yeah, that will allow you to have the right financial systems and management in place, to have the right priorities. If you need money, you'll know where you need to put your money. You will you will, you will overcome, or at least you'll be able to um, um, prevent issues of fraud and misappropriation. Usually that happens when you don't have the right systems and processes in place and you are blinded because maybe you don't understand the numbers and the people you have do not even help you see uh, where problems are. So this is a great opportunity. I think I'll stop from here and I'll ask if there are any questions regarding what I have presented. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about the network. It, it could have been network. All right. Uh, thanks yeah. a lot, Troy, uh, for that submission. Very, very detailed and nice submission. Uh, a number of eye-opening moments. And I think the comments that are coming through clearly show that uh, many of us have never looked at business through the eyes of an investor. You talked about the intention to build and sell that is usually uh, something which many people don't consider. You talked about our, what you call the ownership syndrome. The fact that people selling is a sign as the street will say that to with them. People, the moment you sell, they are convinced that this is a clear sign of failure. So selling the business has never been as seen as success. And, uh, and, and I think those are really very, important messages that came through you talked about the pitfalls that we could uh, we could uh, we could uh, we could uh, uh, encounter as we walk on this journey uh, i think those are all very interesting uh, arguments and i see a couple of people who want to ask a question i will give them a chance at least for the next 20 or so minutes we'll have a chance to engage with roy please come through with your question if you want to ask in the chat box do that uh, I see Dennis. I'll give Dennis the first opportunity uh, to ask. We'll take a couple of questions and I'll give you a chance to answer. Dennis, please go ahead and ask. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dennis. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Loy, and of course, Ronald, we always appreciate uh, This is very, very rich uh, presentation. Uh, now, um, you have highlighted about the ownership uh, uh, syndrome, which is very for sure true. And looking at the context we operate in, uh, for me, always the dilemma is, uh, and where you, I want your guidance on that, is about acquiring someone's business. Usually, we think yes, the business is not performing. Uh, why you? Is a lot of a lot of questions. You no, know? why are you selling your business? Uh, why why would I take that business? If the business is being you know, progressing well, uh, generating revenues for you, uh, why why do you trigger to, to sell your business? And for me, this has been a quite um, a dilemma to take that decision. So I would like a guidance on that. Um, lastly, you talked about, um, yes, of course, uh, debt, uh, equity, and also glance, uh, grant, yeah? uh, how do you link these uh, three elements? If I want to generate revenues, uh, I mean, uh, capital for, for my business, uh, uh, how would I tap into grants versus uh, equity uh, versus uh, uh, debts? Thank you. Ronald, should I go ahead and answer or I wait for more? Uh, thank you, Dennis, for that submission. We could take one or two more questions, and then you could uh, you could answer that round in uh, at a go. I see Elizabeth saying scaling strategies can be a distraction 
variable costs, uh, variable expenses you can outsource and be on task. This has sunk in. I think Elizabeth was just mentioning to uh, the, the, the point which you made about uh, scaling strategies and how they can uh, kind of be diversionary. I see Gerald just saying thank you. Uh, I, I think for Gerald, something which hit home is this case between acquiring versus leasing and uh, how that uh, kind of allows working capital to become available to you if you choose a lease strategy other than an acquiring strategy. Uh, Fadila is saying thank you for the session, very insightful. Elizabeth says, I've learned a lot in a short time about the program. Does it favor trading companies? I think, Roy, you can respond to Elizabeth's question. Does it favor trading companies, e.g. distributors of cosmetic companies, uh, distributorships? Uh, is that something which can favor the program which you made uh, mention of? Uh, I think uh, Roy has shared, uh, Lucia was asking for the contact. I think you have shared that. It's what is on the screen right now. Uh, Emma, uh, Emma Segona says, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Kindly share the presentation in the chat, in the PDF for further reading. I think usually for everyone who joins the call, we do share the presentation with you in a follow-up email a, a day or two after the session. So you should be able to get that. Uh, Maureen says, my bakery made 2.5 years, but closed in July. I would like the financial accounting help to reopen so that I can, so that to have the systems in place. I desperately need your help. Am I eligible? Aha. Uh -huh. So you have seen that question. Uh, you could also address that. It's in the chat box. How do I apply for the opportunity? You talked about, Lucia is asking. I think a number of people want to know how they can get into that opportunity. And does the program favor beginners in the knitting and tailoring? Uh, yes, you talked about the criteria of any program, I think, when you started, Roy. So you can possibly highlight that criteria again. We can take that round of questions and we could take another round after that. Roy, over to you. Uh, Roy is muted. Okay, okay. I'll start with pasting a uh, link of the program. I don't know if it's, uh, it's, it allows. Ronald, I've tried to paste this program. I don't know if it is, uh, it is there on the, on the chat. Let me try again. Uh, but still, it's something that you can share the link later. I've tried to paste it. Uh, it seems not to be able. Okay. Um, so I'll start with the, was it Abasa or something? He, he mentioned about debt equity grant. Now I talked about two instruments, debt and equity. I didn't talk about grants. Now I'll mention that, I'll, 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 I'll explain it in two ways. Grants are good, grants are good. But in business, if you want to control your destiny, the challenge is most grants come with strings attached. And these strings may actually ask you to veer off your vision. So you may be targeting to move in this path, in this direction, but yes, the grant is free money, okay? But sometimes it comes with strings which take both your time and energy off the core objective. So what we usually recommend is you'd rather be in your direction and a grant comes in favoring the direction that you're trying to move or serving the impact that you are trying to do. Most entrepreneurs, unfortunately, because they start with the grant mindset, unfortunately start looking for grants to do what the grant wants. Yet grants, uh, yet me, instead of meeting grants that fulfill what they are trying to do. So um, that is the only caution. Um, it's not bad. And if it finds you when you already have impact, you're already doing certain activities, you'll actually always find I've, we've worked with entrepreneurs who about for who simply grants attracted grants by virtue of what they were doing. So if a grant finds you doing what you are doing, 
then it will actually boost the direction that you're trying to go. So I would only caution on the grant bit. I've seen people basically veer off their entire business simply to impress a grant, which at the end of the day, did you want to just pursue a grant or did you want to actually build a business? That's a question that you need to answer. Then about debt and equity, the best way to determine is when you have your financials, uh, how your business works in terms of how you are, your financials work, your, your financial cycle, how your financial cycle works, uh, the sector that you are in or the business model that you are using, it helps you determine. And depending on what you need that money for, if you need, say, machinery or you need to build, then uh, you are likely to prefer, even if it is debt, it should be development financing, okay? Money that is fairly patient. Okay, sometimes we go for debt and we want to say build. Imagine you get maybe 500 and they, start, they want you to start paying maybe in the next one month, two months, three months. Does it make sense? Okay, so the choice of financing depends on a number of factors which are the, within your business. So depending on the business that you do, um, how you conduct your business, how much you are making, what you need the money for, will predetermine what kind of financing would be suitable for you at that particular point in time. Um, why sell a business? A, it's, it's interesting. Okay, this is, um, I don't know how best to explain this, but I wanted, um, I, 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 will use, I will use a biblical, a biblical instruction. The first instruction God gave man was, I want you to be fruitful and multiply what I have given you. So he gives you a seed that has to become a fruit. So the seed is probably the idea, the unique business that you have. Now it has to become a fruit. A fruit is something valuable that people can consume. But we want a lot of these fruits. So that means this, the fruit has to produce more seeds. And, but for that to happen, you need to multiply, but as you multiply, you it becomes less of you, but more of the community. So you will earn more by being less. And that is why still biblically you are supposed to, um, they say the greatest is the servant of all. So your seed should, you should serve more, but as you serve more, you earn more, but you're actually gaining a lot. Okay, so why, why sell a business? You Selling a business does not mean you, you sell entirely. You may actually have 1% of your business, but your 1% is valued at over a billion. I usually give entrepreneurs two examples. The example of Charles Mirage. Uh, MTN made, uh, was it 600, 600, uh, 400, 400, 400 billion. It made 400 billion last year. Charles Mirage has about 3.4 something percent of MTN. He's not even in the team, he's in the chairman. Basically, when they make profit or whatever, how much is he earning when they make a profit of 400 million, billion, okay? Another example is equity. I've paid a lot of interest on equity bank because uh, they are really scaling fast. Now, their current uh, group, uh, ED and chairman, he's not chairman, but their group ED is called James Mwangi. James has... 3.99% of equity bank. Equity bank during COVID, just post COVID, that was last year, it made, um, it made an equivalent of $300 million profit, net profit. It, uh, it actually made 99% profit. Now remember he's the group executive director. So one is an employee where he earns an equivalent of Uganda shillings probably 20 times um, 30, so he earns close to close to 100 million a month or something, uh, close to 100 million as an employee, salaried employee. And then he owns three point something percent. You know, when you sell a lot of your stake, it's like you've sold your company, but you own a small piece. But the company made $300 million. How much did he take home? He can even afford to go to Hawaii and just sleep at the lake and enjoy his money. Ideally, you are supposed to build value and let the entire world consume it. But as the entire world consume it, you are sharing the resource, the opportunity, but you are also equally earning more. 
that should be the ideal picture. Unfortunately, in Africa, most of us do not scale for others to consume. We want to keep the consumption in our communities, in our villages, and not the world. The Chinese want you to consume their products. You don't want the Chinese to consume your product. So with imagine a vision where you just want to scale in Kampala while somebody wants to scale in an entire continent. With 1%, he scales in an entire continent. With you, 100%, you are only in Kampala and you expect to compete with him resource-wise and whatever. So unfortunately, what happens is you, you end up being the earliest riser. You wake up at five and you sleep at 10 every single day. Your business gives you stress. You don't uh, add competence and whatever where it grows. And at the end, it's the business which kills you with blood pressure and so many other things. When you could actually share the risk, share the burden and grow the business to another level. Anyway, I hope that is a better way to explain. Like realistically, that is, that is what we are supposed to do. The choice of doing it is ours, but that is ideally what we are supposed to do. Uh, so why sell a business is to allow the business to get competent team, to get the resources to scale as far and as wide as it can. And as it does that, you actually earn more with less stress. Because imagine 1% of your business, even if it is it makes a loss, you only get a loss of 1%. But if you have 100%, the loss is yours not for any other person. That's the beauty about it. Yes, it requires you to be selfless, not selfish. Most of us are selfish, not selfless. But the mindset of the business for it to scale, you need to be selfless. You need to collaborate with the best to be the best. Um, uh, my business is 2.5 years and it closed. Now, unfortunately, this program is a collaboration and we are simply coordinating it. So if you are reviving it and you have 10 employees, then it makes sense you can apply. However, I am equally happy to recommend um, a financial CFO coach or just to just guide you or help you review it. Uh, well, it may be as a mentorship. Um, you can discuss if it involves some cost, but I'm sure it will be fairly close to pro bono. But I'm happy to recommend if, um, if you need that kind of recommendation but particularly for the program it is targeting uh, sustaining and increasing jobs so if it finds you when you've created they want you to sustain and increase the jobs and equally access resources from investors that's why they targeted um, they targeted uh, companies which have at least 10 employees well that does not mean as imuka we focus only on companies that have 10 employees we only we focus even in people who have less, but uh, in this particular program, that is the requirement. Um, I hope I've answered the first, the first questions. I don't know if there's another question. Uh, thank you, Roy. Uh, I think if, you, if, if we have another question, please just uh, put up your hand. I'll give you a chance to ask. Uh, we have one coming in the chat box about um, about leasing uh, have landlords in the rural setting understood this often once the business flourishes landlords want to change their minds so someone leases you and when they see things are going very well they say ah, by the way the rent i charge doesn't seem to be enough i think we should have charged more or the landlord wants to come into the business which you have been doing so uh, Roy, you can comment on that, especially on the leasing option. And I think I'll possibly add a question, uh, just add a bit to that question, specifically on leasing. Where do you hit a balance? I saw a number of people during COVID, uh, for example, there are schools which you are using a leasing model and they were leasing properties uh, for, for the schools and they had scale, but uh, where the fact that their properties were leased, it was very expensive during such shock. So where do you find uh, the balance? Uh, then I think, Roy, I would also want to hear a bit more on um, on this journey of, uh, of uh, how you move from one partner to the next. Uh, you talked about uh, Series A, Series B, Series C. How does that journey work? And what should someone think about to be able to succeed 
in such a journey. You can take those and then we can, uh, we can see how far we go after that. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ronald. I'll start with the leasing option. So um, there's a reason why it's called leasing and not renting. So leasing implies that you're actually leasing and leasing has time. And that's why people don't lease for one year, rarely. You'll find guys who lease, especially. I don't know if you've seen the Chinese and these guys who want to set petrol stations. They will lease for like 10 years. If uh, some of these banks, when they come, they want to come to your building, they'll pay you for like five years, 10 years. They will negotiate a very low rate, one. And you, obviously you need the money. Then you may be desperate. You may say, okay, let's sign a deal. We're going to pay you five years. They may not pay the entire figure, but you've signed a deal that we are say we are paying you five years. Okay, it could be in three installments or whatever, but you've signed the leasing agreement. So once you sign, they will pay whatever amount based on the agreements. Just, just the same way you buy. The, the beauty about leasing is it reduces a lot of risk. Imagine you are buying an entire building or whatever, and then that business does not work. How much have you lost? But with leasing, you've minimized the risk and allowed resources on the right objective or the core objective of the business. And that is the beauty about the leasing option. Okay. Um, so leasing, you as long as you're going for the leasing option, you negotiate the years. How you pay that is something else. It's your negotiating tactic and ability. But as long as you sign. Uh, so if a landlord comes midway, that is breach of contracts contract and usually that is legal so you can actually take them to court to pay you damages imagine you are to change and do what would that cost entail so if they are willing to pay you that cost then well okay so that is why people have leasing it's it's a de-risk approach but it's something that investors appreciate because you are putting your money on the core and not on just investing or sinking money on the things that are not core Remember, most of most people are typical investors. Even if you are an investor, you would want to multiply the money, not sink the money before you start multiplying. So most of them want to see the money regenerating or multiplying, being utilized in generating more, not sinking. Schools were leasing. Yes, it happens. Um, it, it, it happens. Uh, schools, um, just the same way I could lease and I cannot operate. Those are special circumstances. Um, and the only way is communication and negotiation. Just the same way I may have uh, engaged an investor. Um, I got maybe a loan or an equity investment and somewhere along the way, either circumstances, the environment, the policies changed. Communication, you can renegotiate, even with the banks. Some of us had loans during during COVID, okay, in business, you'll always have some of these things in place. You restructure and you renegotiate, but you keep the communication on. Trust me, that is the only thing uh, uh, investors want. Somebody who is who has good character, who will communicate in good times and in bad times. We don't expect that everything will be rosy, okay? Uh, there are times when things are difficult and so you can renegotiate the same way you can renegotiate maybe with the landlord and tell him you know what i've not been working can we renegotiate now since i've not worked maybe for three years i would like to extend my lease for an additional three years i will pay you an additional like this is it okay they will obviously it's it's really a communication issue which sometimes uh depending on the character that you have you may feel like ah, i need to escape uh, these people are bothering me, he's over calling me. But sometimes when you are honest and you are direct, these are things that can amicably be solved. In fact, I've seen entrepreneurs who have lost loans. They say the bank gave you money. Business, things did not go well, but you are supposed to pay. And you go to the bank and say, okay, you know what? I have this proposed. This did not work for whatever reasons, but we've put these measures in place and we need an additional 100 million the bank will give you, but it depends on how you build your reputation. That is the one thing that uh, entrepreneurs are encouraged to have. They, they, you will always find in outside circles, 
um, people saying, why is it that most companies that have whites in quotes get money? There is something attached. Uh, there is that perception that when they are there, there is a bit more of goodwill and communication where people will be more honest. But it's something that we also need to improve in terms of culture. We we need to be honest. If things are bad, say things are not working now. This has happened. Uh, I'm happy to you get. It is normal. Okay. I think you've seen currently there's a cryptocurrency something company FTX. Very big company, it was worth 32 billion. Its value is now zero. They have signed bankruptcy. Okay. But their CEO, who is considered, has gone out and said, I'm trying my level best. I want to ensure that I recover and get back on my feet. Some of you may have escaped to the village and switched off and thrown your phones. So it's really a character issue. Um, I think I've talked about schooling, moving from one partner to another. So the ideal picture of a business is when a business starts, it starts with your personal savings, uh, you start selling, you make some profit, but the core in an investment's eye, profit is important, but growth is paramount. We want you to grow because as you grow, you are attracting more market, you are serving more market. And the more market you serve, the more resources you attract, okay? But growth requires more money. So. It's very interesting that even some of the richest companies or the most valuable companies have loans, okay? But here you may find somebody is making profit, but he feels, oh, I'm making profit, I don't need a loan. It's because you don't have a vision, you're not expanding. But you may be surprised uh, companies like Apple or whatever may be having loans in their balance sheets, okay? But it's purely for them to expand and scale, okay? So you are making profit, it's good, but the expansion, and that is why I still told you the biblical produce, eh? be fruitful and multiply. They are in the process of multiplying and serving more. For you to serve more, you need a lot of resources. And that is why uh, at year, say year zero, my savings. Year two, I borrow or I get an investor giving me 100,000. Now I want to expand from Uganda to East Africa. I will, I will need like 500,000. I'll get, now I'll give that investor maybe 10%, okay? As I expand from maybe East Africa to East and Central Africa, I'll need another 1 million to serve in that entire region. Now, this other investor who is coming, now remember I had now 90%. 90%, it continues reducing. At the end of the day, I may even have 2%, 1%. I may sell if I so wish, even the entire thing. But as my stake reduces, my service is increasing. As my stake reduces, my service is increasing. So actually my value is increasing as my stake reduces. So from each round, from each partner, in fact, as I said, each investor comes with an exit strategy. So many times the preference is they will sell to another investor or they will allow another investor to come in at the next stage where you need more money. And that is usually, it's expected. Eh? It's only on our side that we may want, okay, I will buy back my stake, but usually you will want more money because the more you need, the, to, you need a lot of money a lot of money to scale. So that is the typical. So you will start with pre-seed uh, round, seed round, pre-seed maybe you attract $50,000, Seed, you attract maybe 200,000. Uh, series A, the rounds are called in different. Series A, maybe you attract uh, 2 million. Series B, you attract 5 million. Okay? Uh, but as you attract, your stake reduces, but your service is increasing. You have resources. And that is why we don't expect you as an entrepreneur to say, ah, I am not even paying myself a salary when it is year two, year three. If the business is highly innovative and you've attracted, you need to put salary in your, in your, in your profit and loss. So you need to pay your salary. If, even if the business makes a loss and, uh, and you have a competent team and you have the right strategies, you will not, it's just that we like being selfish and with the selfishness, we also suffer more. I hope I've answered. Thank you. Wow, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Troy. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left. I wanted you to touch quickly on Maureen's question uh, on uh, 
acquiring an existing businesses. These businesses usually have many issues and you acquire, they have debts, they didn't tell you how should someone go around this. Uh, you can just quickly wrap that up and then we can wrap up the session. So before acquiring every investor, so by you interesting, interested in acquiring a business, you always do what we call due diligence. You just don't wake up and say, I'm going to buy and you've not assessed what you are buying. So there is a due diligence process, which you can do, or you can hire uh, experts in MOOC access is there. There are quite a number of uh, organizations that can offer you the service of due diligence, where they'll do due diligence, assess compliance, assess if there are loans, assess everything, and then give you uh, a report, which will now allow you to make an informed decision. Remember, an investor does not invest without the due diligence process. And it's through that, that due diligence that they may find maybe your financial management and systems are not in place. Maybe the leadership, maybe I want to invest, but these people are so stringent. They are so rigid. Their mind is not flexible. They are not looking at growing. They are so short-sighted. And that may change your mind. Okay, or your scaling strategy, maybe they, okay, and they are not willing to listen. I have, we run a program called Pitch Fest. So there's an entrepreneur who pitched uh, and a Kenyan investor really loved him and wanted to invest in him. And he, he was to do tractors. He was doing tractors in Western region and he was supporting farmers, but the investor wanted him to make it a scalable model where he just is not just the one buying tractors, but where he could, he could also work with others in serving more. And he didn't want to change. So the investor changed his mind. So these things happen. So it's, um, uh, you, there's a due diligence process which allows you to make the informed decision. And I am aware that in whichever sector, in whichever business you want to buy, whether it's a salon or a factory, you will find many similar companies doing the same thing. So you can evaluate more than just the same way investors evaluate many businesses and decide to invest in one or two or three or four. Okay, so uh, your interest to acquiring, meaning you have to go through a due diligence or do a due diligence process so that you make an informed investment. Okay, but it is part and parcel. It's something that you, I would highly encourage. Um, you may actually invest and you actually get a very competent entrepreneur that you can work with and move to another level. Okay, and they may add new ideas or they may add new competences that you may not have. Okay, and some, if we have corporates here who, who want to be in entrepreneurship, one of the best ways is to actually do acquisition instead of starting a business. You don't have, you only spend one hour in the business, they steal and whatever. If you don't have the time, but you are interested and obviously you can add a few ideas in the process, but you are more into the employment, then acquire a company eh, or invest in a company where you have stake and support it to another level. You can still achieve your core goals and objectives. You don't necessarily need to start one. Um, there was a question, uh, I think I've explained this. Um, somebody is saying, I share a slide of CFO services. I don't know which slide it was. I think, I think, I think possibly the, 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 the link, uh, the, the, they were speaking to, to the link to the, to the program you mentioned, the CFO program. You mentioned. Oh, I think what I'll do, uh, Ronald, is I'll, when I share the slides, I'll equally just share the link for those ones who are interested. Uh -huh. I that's think perfect. That will, I think, yeah, that will be better if it's okay. Well, that, that's absolutely perfect. I think we're, we're, our team, uh, our team Derek and the team will uh, will share will share an email in a couple of days, and we'll include the link to the to the program which Roy has mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think we are just left with a minute, but Roy, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we are very honored for sharing with us. Ah, the link is right there. Roy has put it in the Yeah, in the but chat. I'll equally share more information when I yeah. share the slides, just for those ones who are interested. Super. Roy, thanks a lot for this subject. Uh, go out there, consider, I want to start a business. Can I buy a business? That's a, an important question many people don't ask themselves and don't even pay attention to. And uh, I think Roy pointed to the fact that there are so many perceptions around this whole investment space. 
And those perceptions influence the way we actually operate. Roy, thank you so much for sharing your heart. It's been an honor. I want to thank everyone who has taken off time to join the meeting today. We'll be back next week on Thursday on a different subject. But largely why we are here is to make sure our businesses recover stronger. So take on Roy, link up with him, share this contact. Roy, I'm going to ask that you just put your phone number again in the chat box. Please reach out to him and Imuka Access. Roy, thank the Imuka Access team for releasing you for today. We are very honored that you have, uh, you have taken time and joined us today. Uh, from Enterprise Uganda, thank you so much for coming. And I uh, will be back next week. Have a blessed day.